Welcome to another episode of the Office Altering Higher and Empower with Molly McGrath podcast. If you're a returning listener, welcome back. If you're a first time listener, hopefully you'll become a long time listener. As always, I'm your show host, Molly McGrath, founder of Hiring and Empowering Solutions and creator of this revolutionary podcast. You can check us out at hiringandempowering.com. Oh my goodness. All right. You guys, you listeners here, you attorneys, listen up. We have a hot, hot topic today that we're talking about HR issues for lawyers. You all know this. <laughs> I always hear, you know, I do recruiting, flappy retain search. I have a law firms every single day that will sign my contracts. And it's fascinating to me because they'll come back and I'm like, well, what, what, per the contract, and they're like, what does the contract say? I'm like, you're a lawyer. You didn't read the contract. What the heck's going on here? But, you know, all joking aside, you know, there's a whole other thing going on. I am so excited, Alan, because our guest today, we have the best of the best. We have Alan Crone of the Crone Law Firm, basically by and large national, a um, few states that they haven't served in, in regards to practicing law. But it, as you can see, I'm going to put it in the show notes, the crone I want you to go crone law firm, plc.com. It's going to be in the show notes, post their social channels, looking at their practice areas. But we're also, I want you to pay attention to their core values that are right on their website, talking about the purpose of the website, just a small drive-by coaching for you law firms. Uh, make sure you have this on your website. Your website, Ellen, is beautiful. You've done an extraordinary job because a lot of times your future employees, whether virtual, hybrid, 1099, W2, what have you, the first thing they do is go to your website. I do recruiting in this insane insane market. I'm telling you right now, our rec my recruiters are losing sleep. Nobody's budging. We can't get attorneys to take jobs. We can't get paralegals to take job. The struggle is real. But what's fascinating to us through our recruiting and poaching and out outboard um, efforts, what we do is we send the law firm name once we find out the person's um, a good fit and we'll send the website. And it's amazing to me how many people ghost us and they don't reply or what have you. But if you have a rocking website that really talks about your purpose, your why, your mission, your core value, your value pillars, what have you, as you'll see with the Chrome Law Firm, hands down, people will call us right back. They're like, all right, tell me about this law firm because they can get your tonality, your energy, your personality. So Alan, thank you so much for being our guest here today. I just had a kind of gush over you about a wonderful job that you've done with your website. Oh, you're awfully nice. We've worked really hard at it. And uh, let me just jump right in from what you just said is perfect. Um, I believe that you've got to have you've got to have three things in order to have a successful business from an HR perspective. This is whether you're a law firm, a dental office, a factory. First thing is you got to have a mission. And you've got to recruit to that mission. You want people mm -hmm. like for us we're we're all about employment law, we're about making a uh, making a uh, discrimination free workplace and a compliant workplace, whether we're representing employees, executives, or entrepreneurs. And if someone is tuned into that mission, you, you that's half the battle right there, because if, if somebody doesn't care about your mission, if they just want a job in 2023, that's, that's going to lead to bad things. That's going to lead to bad things. The second thing you have to have are values, and you need to recruit to those values. If one of our core values is reliability, and it's a 360 thing, right? We want our employees to be reliable. We want to be reliable to our, to our team members. We want to be reliable to opposing counsel, to our clients, everybody else. Well, if that's not one of your core values, you don't need to come work for us. We're going to have problems if, if you don't uh, buy into that core value and, and every other one. And then lastly, I think you need to have fun. You need to enjoy mm -hmm. what you're doing. And if you, if you buy into those first two, you know, I, I'm not talking about, uh, uh, you know, foosball uh, in, in the break room or, you know, <laughs> going, to, yeah, going <laughs> to a movie every Friday, that kind of fun. I'm just saying, you, you know, people, if they're aligned with your mission, they're, if they're aligned with your values, they're going to enjoy 
working with you and for you, however you want to put it. And if you can get alignment in that area, then you're not going to have a lot of problems with discrimination and discipline and all these other things because you've 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 hired to those things. And if you can make a good hire, that helps employment law become a non-issue. Oh my goodness. So right up front, I, and you saw me, I got my pen, my pencil. I am taking notes here. I love that because you used in all three, well, two and one and two, mission and recruit to that mission values and recruit to that and when you have that in place and you're picking the right people you're hiring the right people you're up you're up front you're clear about that but fun like that i think just even communicating that right up front for when you're hiring people and you're adding to your team and you emulate that throughout your business and you have consistent, oh, I think before we started recording, and I'm sure you're going to get in there, when you're constantly over communicating, you're figuring out if somebody's unhappy, you're figuring out if they're dropping the ball. And even, especially in law, like it's stressful. It is. And the consequences are very real, right? So you have that, then you coupled, you're in the business a law. Now you own a business and you have a law firm. And when you are up just uptight and everything is very rigid and hard and heavy and stressful and finger pointing and it's my way or the highway and there's not communication. I think right there, you're dealing with a house of cards to begin with. I, I think you're absolutely right. And in 2023, um, you know, the, the strategies, the tactics that worked in the 80s uh, and, and 90s, they're not going to work anymore. Uh, people have, uh, I, I saw this morning uh, on TikTok, uh, Gary V exactly. had a little 10 second deal and, he, and he's talking to a bunch of business owners, probably my age in their fifties. And he says, you know why you can't get anybody to work for you? Uh, why they don't want your 40, 50, 60, $70,000 a year jobs. They can make that on, on, they can make it on TikTok. They can make it by flipping things on eBay. Uh, that's why it's so important these days. You, you've got to give your team members a mission. And if, if they buy into your mission, then, then, and you get the right people on the bus. I mean, you want to get people that are smart and have the skills and, and that sort of thing. But if they really buy into your mission and they buy into your values, they'll, they'll walk through a wall for you and they won't want to go anywhere else because there's no place. There are very few places, particularly in law firms that really instill that mission and law firms have ought to be above and beyond everybody else on mission because what do we do? We help injured people when they're when they're hurt and they're at their worst. We help people get out of bad marriages. We defend people in court. We help people with their employment situation. It goes on. We help them buy a house. Everything that we do as lawyers is it can be can be missionized, if you will. And uh, you don't want to hire somebody if they to be a paralegal in a family law uh, practice if they don't like family law and if they don't, if they, if, if they don't want to see uh, that mission fulfilled. And sometimes you've got to be very careful about who you hire. And sometimes you've got to let someone who on paper looks really, really good. Oh, look there, whatever assessment you're using, whether it's Wonderlick or, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of them. Sure. Uh, and you say, oh, this person scored really highly. And but if in the if in the interview they they don't say well why do you want to come work here and if they don't say because I want to help people let's say it's a family law firm I want to help people who are in the middle of the divorce I want to help give them peace of mind so they can move on with their family if they just say well I really you know like a challenge well that between those two people I want the former not the latter yep yep I love so much that you said first of all you're watching TikTok. Gary V just comes out of your mouth like a household name, but also I love, love what you said. And I know we're going to get into the HR issues, but I think we are now yeah. because we're saying you're laying the foundation where it is not like, all right, you're walking into a courtroom from day one. You're on the witness stand from day one. That's not how you want to treat your employees. And so many interviews I get in with the attorneys, one of two things, this 
crazy market. If in 2003, there's an attorney that's unemployed or a paralegal that's unemployed looking for a job, that should be red flag number one, unless right. it is an immediate transition. Just got transferred. My, my spouse got transferred. The partnership, I just interviewed someone today. The partnership that it's an old school 85 year old attorney who had no succession plan. He's like, eh, I don't need the money. I'm closing the firm. Like it's there. It's these very unique human situations, but I love what you said. So often I'll send resumes over and the attorney's like, Nope, don't want to meet that person. They don't have the credentials. They don't have a skill set, what have you. And often it's like, you're hiring the human being First and foremost, because a human being is the one who's going to slap you with a employment lawsuit versus a human doing. And I love it. You said there's wonder, like there's Colby, there's this, there's no shortage of these assessments. And so often people will say, well, I want them to take these assessments. And, you know, it's about the resume and the assessment and that's it. And then I'll get the phone call six, seven, eight months later. And there's a colossal dumpster fire sitting on their desk because that's how they interview. That's how they hire. Yeah, you've got, you know, here's the, the employment law part of it. Please. This is why I always say employment law, uh, business owners need to think of uh, employment law compliance as good business. Because there, if you if you approach an employment law problem and say, okay, how can I make my business better by complying with this employment law, you'd be amazed at how, how well you can do. And I'll give you an example, job descriptions. Most people, you know, They'll say, I need a job description. They'll go on the internet. They'll throw something together. Um, and maybe when they did it, it was a great job description. Well, then three years go by, five years go by. Well, let's throw the same job description back up. I'll bet you a million dollars that the person, the incumbent who's leaving, not doing that job anymore. Oh my it's God. changed. It's morphed. And you've got to know what you're hiring for. You've got to be able to answer the question. If you can't answer this question, you need to rethink it. What does it take to be successful in this role at your firm? You would be amazed at the number of people who can't answer that question. You need to know, okay, what are the essential functions of the job? Now, you need to know that for American with Disabilities Act uh, compliance and other things, but you need to know, okay, I've got this accountability chart or organizational chart or whatever you want to call it. Is that something you threw together? you know, from the ether, or is that something you've really thought about? Okay, how do how do the different parts of my firm interact with one another? And how does um, this person in this intake position or in this a case manager position or a lawyer position, what is it, what do I really want from them to be successful? And one lawyer that you hire as a, as a trial associate, you may hire another lawyer to do, maybe it's a pre-lit. You want completely different uh, skill sets with that. And unless you really know how your, your business works, the business side of the profession, um, you, then you're going to be at a handicap because then you're just going to be hiring people based on, well, you know, I like them, or they had a great interview. You know, what does that mean? Or they, you know, they have a great resume. Um, and, you know, I, to me, the only thing I look at in a resume is length of service, you know, um, because if someone's been one place for a long time, that tells you something. Yes. Uh, or if they if they hop around, that tells you something else. But unless you know, unless un unless you know intimately how those firms that they where they've been before, how they act and operate, you know, you don't know anything about what this person thinks a paralegal job is or uh, a, a legal job is. So that's why I say if you recruit a, and hire based on your mission and core values and people who align with that, it doesn't matter what they did someplace else. You can get skill assessments and all that to make sure, you can ask the questions like, you know, how would you approach uh, answering requests for interrogatories or whatever it, it may be and find out they have the technical skill. But what you want is somebody's humble and somebody who works for, wants to work for your company for whatever reason. And going back to what you said, at the very beginning, you're always recruiting. Your brand, you're not just recruiting clients, you're recruiting uh, employees. And you should always be trying to make your, your firm a place that people are knocking down your door to get into, where people are calling you saying, hey, do you have anything open? That should be your, 
your um, your goal. Yes. Oh, wow. I have pages and notes here. Oh, my goodness. This is incredible. So much that you, you've you said. First of all, congratulations for being an extraordinary business owner, leader, and boss. Truly, it is. You know, I always, I saw, uh, like it or lump it, you know, the people that bag on some of these big firms and what have you, I'm like, no, actually, you need to really pay attention because of the way like I saw um, a big law firm, Morgan and Morgan speak at one time. And he said, you know what? This is how I hired. Were you a paper boy? That's the first question. Were, were you paper boy? Did you bag groceries when you were 15 years old? Did you have this? If so, you're hired. To your point, they're humble, they're hungry, and they work hard. And they were there's and I love that you say that because my attorneys here that are listening to this, that are turning down every single human being I'm sending to you, model Alan Crone's law firm and what he's doing because they're you're pivoting. Like you said, the days of how we ran it in the 50s and the 60s is no longer working. So you have the foundation, and hopefully our listeners are like, all right, Alan, you know what? We're adopting this mission and recruit from there values and recruit from there and fun in the fabric in the walls i love that you said i like that visual they'll run through a wall for you really truly i i i believe every single person you work with absolutely would say that even if they're no longer with you for whatever reason they come back and say absolutely salt to the earth greatest place to work for now you have the fun You've recruited right. Your your mission, your vision, your values are so crystal clear to you, and they're in the fabric in the walls of your law firm, virtual, brick and mortar, what have you. Now, talk to us about these HR issues and uh, attorneys, assuming they have this foundation, because we are talking about HR issue, people. This is a critical one I'm hearing from you, and I love that I, I'm right there with you, and I've been screaming this from the rooftops. Now what? So you've done this right. Now, what do you really need to pay attention to? Well, that's uh, there's so much waterfront to cover there. Let me take one that's kind of boring and then one that's kind of fun. Yes. Uh, the first one is, is compensation. All right. Um, there are a lot of law firms that uh, probably have uh, wage and hour violations uh, because they're maybe they're paying their paralegals. Uh, it's well settled paralegals are not exempt from overtime. And if you're paying your paralegals a, uh, a salary and they're working more than 40 hours in any given work week and you're not paying them some sort of premium for overtime, um, you may have a violation. Now, if you've got 20 paralegals, 10 hours a week, do the math on that, that can be, that can be pricey. Devastate, yes. So that's the first thing is make sure you're right. If, if you're paying anybody by the hour, anybody, then you owe them overtime. So whether you pay by the hour or a salary, that does, that's not the end of the conversation. But there are a lot of people who pay, uh, there are a lot of hospitals, for example, that pay nurses by the hour. Nurses, if they're paid a salary, are exempt from overtime. But as soon as you pay them hourly, you have to, you have to pay overtime. Same thing with lawyers. Um, so, so that's the first thing is, is are your uh, compensation policies righteous? And, um, uh, uh, and and it's one of those things that if uh, you could go, you could go an entire career, and and never have the Department of Labor knock on your door, never have uh, a disgruntled employee. But that's where I get most of my um, uh, overtime claims. We do a lot of overtime claims. Is people get fired or they leave, they get disgruntled. And they go see a lawyer about their situation. And the lawyer says, well, you know, you really don't have um, a wrongful termination claim, but let's talk about how you get compensated. Oh, and, oh. and, a, and a smart a smart lawyer will, will do that. Um, the other thing is, is 1099s and independent contractors. Yes, um, please. I believe that 90% or more of the people walking around calling themselves independent contractors are not independent contractors. Uh, if 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 you have somebody working for you and they don't work for anybody else and they come to your place every day and you pretty much tell them what to do and you give them a 1099, that's dangerous because again, you 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 
Some people do that to avoid, um, you know, employment taxes. Some people do it to avoid withholding. Some people do it to avoid uh, overtime or minimum wage or whatever. Um, you really need to find somebody to consult with, whether it's an accountant or a lawyer, to look at your situation and say, is this person truly an independent contractor? And, okay, here's a very uh, esoteric, detailed lawyer's uh, a question. If the person is an independent, they ain't an independent contractor. So uh, I would start from there and then work out. Now, you can have independent contractors. It can be done. But if they're not independent, if they if they're relying on you for their their sustenance, then they're probably not an independent contractor. And even if they are, do you want to be the plain, the defendant who wins that lawsuit and have to pay somebody to get you out of that lawsuit? Um, so that's the, so that's the first thing. Kind of a a, a codicil to that is uh, is virtual workplaces. People who have folks working, you know, three days in the office, two days at home, or vice versa, or whatever, you've really got to communicate with those folks, and you've got to communicate a couple of things up front. First is you have to communicate what their schedule is, right? You have to say, okay, you're you're supposed to work from you know nine to five. That's a forty-hour week. You're supposed to get a a break for lunch. All of these things, and make sure they document when they're working and when they're not working and make sure that you uh, uh, require them to certify, this is when I worked and when I'm not working. And you've got to go overboard to say, look, if you work more than, if you actually work 45 hours this week, I need to know about it. I want to make sure I know and compensate you for how much time that you work. You can manage people's overtime. In other words, you can say, look, before you work that 41st hour in a, in a given work week, you need to get my permission. We need to have a conversation about that. But what you don't want to say is we don't pay overtime right. because that can get misconstrued in a lawsuit later on. Well, he told me well, they don't pay overtime and I had all this work to do. So I just did it off the off the clock. So that's part of, you know, the communication is making sure. And again, it goes back to job descriptions. Do they really have a 40 hour a week job? Yes, I was going to say that. Yeah. You know, do they really have a 40 hour a week job? Um, and if they if they don't, then you need to make sure you understand that as well. Um, and, you know, you I, again, I think that something that that my generation loves that. Uh, the, the, you know, <laughs> what is that This device <laughs> or you know, even even this device? I think that there is I have a rule, a personal rule. I go back and forth with you once via text or email. If it comes back, I'm picking up the phone and I'm talking to you because email and text, if I, if I ever wanted a second career, I would go be an anthropologist, a modern anthropologist, and I'd figure out why email and text get so misconstrued. Oh my gosh. But you, you, you've got to talk to these folks, particularly if they're not physically present with you. And I'll tell you, I'm the world's worst at it. I get in my own zone, in my own silo, and I forget that these, peop these people are out there working with me remotely, and I don't check in with them as much as I should. But that communication is going to help is going to help you. And uh, if you don't want to pay overtime, if you don't want to pay that premium, then you need to manage to that. And, uh, you know, you, you need to make sure at the same time that people understand if they are working, you know, overtime, that they claim it and you, that you pay them for it. And there's a difference between uh, disciplining somebody because they have asked for overtime and disciplining somebody because they're working overtime unauthorized or unnecessarily. And so you would be very careful about how you speak about those two things because um, a lot of people who uh, have overtime claims, they what they hear is, I'm not going to pay for it but I want you to do the work when yes. that may not be what the, what the employer actually means. You know, I, you know, I've had lots of clients on the defense side say, well, I just told them I don't want them to work overtime. But if you could go back to the tape, you would find out what, what they actually said was I don't pay overtime. Right. And when you really think about it, you can see where that would lead to a lot of confusion. 
Especially, I love what you said. I'm telling you, I'm a stickler about these job descriptions in my law firm admin boot camp. I have every single person, the employee, or even if they're 1099, be responsible for their job description. I go, go get your job description, bring it to class. 99% of them come with a job ad they reply to. Like right. not a job description. Now, number two, let's let's start tracking your time. Let's figure out, is this really a 40-hour work week? And as you're talking, I'm writing notes. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is popping up, this is popping up. Yeah, you pick up the phone, you want to have a job description, but then now there's all these Slack channels, which I'm not a fan of, but people love them because it's documented. Well, great, you send them a Slack and they answer at 11 o'clock. Guess what? They're yeah. working. Yep. They're working. And so not only that, but then they're like, oh, it's all documented. But OK, great. I don't want you to work. I don't want you to work overtime, i.e. I'm not paying for overtime. And I send you a message and say, where are you at with this? Where are you at with that? Where is this? What have you? They're like, I'm out of hours. But OK, if I'm replying to this, I'm working. And, you know, it's just really interesting about what you're saying. Documentation and having a conversation and having it up front, I think a lot of times, I mean, going back to 1099, I do by and large W-2 permanent placement. Sometimes there's an attorney that comes back and says, I'd like this attorney. I'm going to give him a try. Let me go back and see. Let me try him out 1099 or, you know, whatever the situation is. And then I, I had an attorney that sent an offer letter to a 1099 contract person that said, you will work Monday through Friday, eight to 4.30. I'm like, oh my God, I'm not even an attorney and you're in violation. You can't dictate there. And to your point, or I'll have people that'll come back and they have 1099 and they're like, well, I'm not going to hire them because they're working for someone else too. I'm like, that's a definition of it. Like you said, if they're not independent, you're in violation by and large. So I love, I, I I truly have pages and notes going back to that job description. Is this really a 40 hour a week work? And what is our process? To your point, sometimes you're going to pick up the phone and maybe I love that you do that and you love that. But then there also is this documentation because if there's a conversation without documentation, it's probably a lawsuit wait, possibly waiting to happen, especially if you don't have your mission and your vision and your cores and your fun in action. Right. Right. And to your point there, um, wow. it, it, to me, it's all about training. If, uh, and, and my new one, I used to just say training. Now I'm adding capacity to that. Um, oh. You know, I have, uh, I've, I can't tell you how many times I have said, uh, you know, cause I've, I've worked with folks like you, you know, documented all these processes, right? And I've got all these processes and I want a demand letter to go out in two weeks and all of this sort of thing. And, um, you know, I'm always banging my head. Why, why aren't people following these processes? Well, it's because they're, they're, uh, they don't have enough capacity to do it. They don't have bandwidth to do it. And, and so that's what another thing that causes problems, right? Causes friction. So uh, I add capacity to that. You've really got to understand, you know, what, what a person's capacity is, what a team's capacity is, and then you got to train them. You got to train. You can't assume that, um, the case manager who's been a star someplace else comes yes. to work for you and that they understand how you want things done. I had a, I had a, uh, a partner years ago, still my, one of my best friends, I love him. Uh, he was, he was a, a lawyer. He was a CPA. Um, he was to, to, to say that he was rigid about how he wanted things done uh, was to minimize rigidity. Okay. Uh, he, he had to, and one of the things was how his documents were stapled. He wanted the <laughs> he wanted the staples like this, not like this, right? And he could tell you he had a he had fifteen minutes worth of material where he would tell you why this is better than this. And long story short, he had somebody working for him that was a habitual uh, diagonal uh, stapler, <laughs> and he was complaining to me about it. And I said, "Well, have you talked to her about it?" He says, "Well, no." When she first got here, I told her how I wanted it done. I said, I think you ought to go talk to her about it and tell her that you, you, you were serious about that. 
Because, you know, that's something a lot of people may just think that, you know, that's a preference as opposed to that's the way I want it done. So he did, and he didn't have any problem with, with it. But that's a small instance of training. Yes, you it is. To train people. And you've got to know how you want it done so that, um, you know, because people can't read your mind. And that's, you know, that's where a lot of uh, discrimination lawsuits and harassment lawsuits and that sort of thing come from is you've got, you've got a round peg, square hole, and there's a way that you can train someone to, uh, uh, to be square so that it fits in, you know, your slot in your team. Um, but you just can't assume, oh, well, they're a paralegal. They should know, they should know that. Or they're, uh, my, my favorite is, well, they're a lawyer. They should know uh, how to, well, unless you train them, how, how are they supposed to know? Um, and so training is so important not just in the first 30 days where you're telling them where the coffee machine is and we use this software or whatever, you've got to have ongoing training to make sure that they're A players. And in 2023, you've got to develop people. You, you know, people have got mm -hmm. to be better to, tomorrow than they are today for them to want to keep coming to your shop to work. And if you're just using them up at, at the, the level they are oh. and you're not giving them the ability to grow professionally, um, people are going to get bored and they're going to go, they're going to go somewhere else. And all that institutional knowledge goes out the door with them. Yep. I see it every day. They'll go somewhere else for $30,000 pay cut for if somebody, I love that. If you're just going to use them up, you have to develop them. I think that's in our core job description as entrepreneurs, business owners, managers, leaders is to grow people up and to help develop them. And I love this whole conversation about continual training and development. I think a lot of times attorneys like, I don't have time to train. Give me somebody who is batteries included. I'm like, great. They're bringing the habits from their prior law firm, number one, but great. Assume they know how to staple the paper precisely. They know how to do everything, substantive law, what have you. Now what? You're hiring a human being. It's a relationship. Do you want them to stay? Because if you do, you still need to help develop them. If they're not growing, if they're not getting better, if you're not growing, they're not getting better. To your point, people get bored. And at this day and age, every moment, every minute matters for us of where we're really looking at, am I making a difference? Am I, they're not, it's not about, am I making bonus? Am I make, yes, it's secondary, but they start looking at that first when they feel like they're not a value creator and they don't feel like it's my absolute honor to run through a wall for you, Alan, because of the environment and the culture that you've created here in this law firm. And I don't ever want to leave because I know if I colossally mess up, if I make a mistake or what have you, we have communication standards I could come to. We have fun. We have systems. We have process. And we have a place where it's not shame, blame, and weaponizing, but we're going to have an adult conversation and be like, all right, what do we want to do to fix this? It's not you're out, you're get out of here, use you up. I love it. Don't use people up. That's amazing. Thank you for saying that. And thank you for, for building a practice that is based on that. Well, you're, you're welcome. You're awfully nice to say. I'm, I always tell people I'm making this up as I go along. I mean, you know, there's no, uh, there are very few playbooks on how to run a law firm and particularly a small law firm. I mean, we've got about 20 employees here. Uh, and that's not a huge place, but, um, you know, I, I've always said that, uh, I want my folks to be able to go get a job anywhere to be that good that they can go get a job wherever they want to, but that I'm trying to make a place where they won't want to, that they want to stay here and they want, they, they like what we built. And again, it goes back to mission and alignment with mission and, and values and that sort of thing. If you give people that then, um, you know, then they're, then they're willing to give you themselves and, you know, be, uh, uh, bring their talents uh, to work every day. And, uh, you know, you talk about quiet quitting. Uh, that's yes. a big issue now. Uh, you know, when I was coming up, we just call that phoning it in. Uh, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, but people quiet quit when they don't feel engaged, when they mm -hmm. don't feel important. Uh, you know, there's an old political mentor of mine who said uh, the key to politics is everybody wants to feel relevant and loved. 
And if you can make people feel relevant and loved in your organization, then uh, they'll be they'll be around for a long time if that's what you want. Absolutely, oh, absolutely. I know I know it to be true. I talk to candidates every day. Wow, Ellen. So talk to our listeners. How can our attorney? Because most of our listeners here are entrepreneurs, business owners, law firm owners. How can they get a hold of you? Can you help? Can, um, can they hop on a call with you to figure out to make certain that they have their ducks in a row, so to speak, in regards to employment law? Sure. Well, my my email address is acrone at cronelawfirmplc.com. You probably put that in the, the show yep. notes. Of, yep. And uh, that's usually the best way to get a hold of me um, is uh, send me an email and we'll set up a time uh, uh, to talk. Uh, they can also uh, shamelessly plug my book, The Law at Work, um, oh. which you can um, which you can get on uh, Amazon. Um, I, I'm uh, I'm on Amazon with Charles Dickens and uh, 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 Hemingway and uh, all of those biggies. You know, it's the same store. You can, you buy me the same place you buy Hemingway. So um, The Law at Work, Alan Crone, C R O N E, um, gives you a lot of these concepts we're talking about now. Um, if you're not an employment lawyer, it gives you a good primer. It is not written for lawyers. It is written for uh, non-lawyers. Um, if I had written it for lawyers, uh, it'd be 20 times larger than it is. Uh, it gives you it gives you good, um, you know, basics of employment law, uh, discrimination, training, all the things that I'm talking about here uh, on the podcast. Great. All right. So our professional law firm administrators, our office managers, our team leaders, go get the book. I'm going to put the link for Amazon, The Law at Work, so you can start get the foundation together. And then as I always train you, go present to your attorney. These are something we need to get in order. We need to look at our contracts. We need to look at our overtime policies and then get on the horn. And thank you, Ellen, for giving your personal email address. I will put that in the show notes. I'm going to put the book in the show notes in addition to your website. You're Thank nice. you for your wealth of knowledge today. Wow. I have pages and notes here. Thank you well, so much. I learned a lot. I would say experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. And I've had 30 years of experience. <laughs> uh, that might be your quote for the show. Okay. <laughs> I love that. That's fantastic. All right, listeners, until next time, listen. Build a firm based on fun. I love, really, truly want to invite you all to take what Ellen's wisdom, knowledge, experience, and put it into practice within your firm and make sure you have your I's dotted, your T's crossed, and your ducks in a row because this is a whole new landscape when it comes to virtual hybrid 10 ND9 contract all the things. So really, I highly encourage you to hop on the Zoom room phone with Ellen and just get some peace of mind. We've reached the end of yet another episode of the Hire and Empower with Molly McGrath podcast, where dream teams of entrepreneurs in an entrepreneur's world really do come true. Listen, whether you're a business owner, employee, executive, or hiring manager, we fully understand hiring, onboarding, and Leadership is expensive, exhausting, often overwhelming, and absolutely time-consuming for the already tax professional. Well, we have your back on all fronts. For 25 years and counting, we have transformed over 4,000 law firm teams into the most efficient, resourceful, and profitable asset of your business. Check out our Smart Hire Solution, our employee leadership program, and the 66-day law firm turnaround at hiringandempowering.com. 